each one of us in the UK is likely to become a carer at some point in our lives. Women have a 50% chance of caring by the time they are 46, and men by the time they reach the age of 57. But the UK's social care system is failing all of us. This includes those that require care, whether this is older or disabled adults, and both formal employed carers and informal carers who tend to be parents, children, siblings or spouses. I'm Rachel Cunliffe, Associate Political Editor at The New Statesman. I'm joined today by Jess Prestige from the Centre for Social Justice, which has recently released a report on government and societal support for working age carers. And also with me in the studio, I have Humphrey Hawksley, former BBC foreign correspondent and author, but here with us today to speak about his experience as a family carer and with the care system for his son, Christopher. Thank you so much, both of you, for joining us and being in the studio with us to discuss this. Humphrey, I wondered if you could start by just telling us a bit about your situation, your experience with the social care system in this country. Uh, Yes, thanks. Thanks, Rachel. And thanks for doing this topic. Uh, It's a very broad and difficult one to understand. But as you say, everybody in this country will be impacted by it or is being impacted it now. My very narrow end of that is I have a son who's just turned 28 who has complex special needs. And this is means that there's physical disabilities, uh, probably learning disabilities and uh, often behavioral things and other things. There are more of these people around now because the survival rates in hospitals are are, are higher. My son has had nowhere to live for nearly five years. He left school, very good school it was. He was a talented musician. He was getting on with people. He was moving through life. And then he fell off what they call a cliff edge. And he has been in a temporary emergency respite center for almost five years. So this country, Britain, has got nowhere for people like him to live or certainly for him to live. We keep getting ideas of where he could go permanently, but and, and we've got one in the pipeline at the moment, which I, I won't talk in detail about. But we've been chasing around and around. Now, I believe that in those Dickensian times or Victorian times or something, there would be a place for him to have gone that would have a piano, that would have a sports pitch, that would have had people of his peer group to mix with. But in this day and age, there is nothing for him. It's a really shocking story and a sort of indictment of how the state has been failing in an area where there are lots of complex and different policy challenges spread about different layers of government. And we've talked a lot on this podcast over the last year about various aspects of state policy that are kind of failing people and and falling apart. Jess, the CSJ has released this report on family carers and how those failures in the state are kind of being met by individuals on an informal level because that support just isn't there. What did you find out? I mean, I suppose the headline finding was that things are really, really difficult for unpaid family carers um, who, as you say, are picking up the slack for state failure. Um, What came through really strongly um, was that it's incredibly difficult for unpaid carers to balance their caring responsibilities and paid employment. And we're absolutely not saying that um, carers should be forced to work if they don't want to. But in our polling, we found that 65% of carers who are currently not working would like to if the right support was available. So they're paying a really high price for the care that they provide. Um, 44% of unpaid carers are in poverty. Their own health really suffers as well because they, they don't have that support to lean on and things get really tough. One of the staggering things I found from your report was both how many people are affected by this, uh, but also the fact that we don't know exactly how many people are affected because there's no kind of national database and we have some idea through local councils, but many people don't see themselves as a carer. They don't necessarily realise that that is the role that they're doing and the support that's available to them. Can you talk us through any of the numbers? Yeah, absolutely. So um, kind of notwithstanding what you say about the uncertainty surrounding the numbers, I think the census is probably our strongest source here. And that suggests there are about 5.7 million unpaid carers across the UK. I think it's 5 million in England and Wales specifically. Um, 
But obviously, what constitutes being a carer can be quite different from person to person. Um, I think the specific question in the census is about providing unpaid care uh, because of physical or mental health conditions um, or issues related to older age. But there are kind of a number of different categories within that broad categorization. So you've got some people who will be providing nine, 10 hours of care a week. The most intensive care category is 50 plus hours per week. So that's kind of very, very intensive. Um, and there are 1.5 million people in England and Wales who are providing that level of care. Andrew, what's your experience of how dealing with the system, both as a carer and also as somebody trying to get the support that your son needs and is entitled to, what does that look like? How does that impact your life? Well, I mean, what Jess just said resonates with me from, you know, when Christopher, my son, was was an infant. And uh, I was uh, didn't realise how much work was needed to get in a physiotherapist, a hospital appointment, a speech and language therapist, a nutritionist, and all these things. That, which are all things that he was entitled to and, and needed. And that's just a handful of it. Uh, and there was a, a time that I looked at this situation and I said, I can't get him across the line as a parent in, in my own thing and hold down my job, which was as a BBC correspondent. Very luckily, um, you know, I was with the BBC and they were brilliant at it. And they, they said, you can go off shift, which means you have to go in at a particular time. And, and I, we broke some incredibly interesting stories, actually, because I was able to burrow down. But that's a big organization and, and, uh, and they were good. The people that are with the small companies and with that sort of thing, they don't have that flexibility. But I did the numbers, which Jess did in the report, of of how much I would not be contributing to the to, to, in my taxes against how much I would be getting from benefits if I actually did that, and it was just ludicrous. It it was it was a bonkers way of doing things. In the report, you you have a section about economic inactivity and the government sort of wider goals to get more people who are designated economically inactive back into work. Now, there are approximately 8.5 million people designated economically inactive. A large proportion of those are students. Uh, a large proportion of those are themselves dealing with long-term health conditions and are unable to work. Uh, but there are a significant proportion who are caring, either if it's childcare or in a, an adult social care setting. The government's talked about childcare as a as a way to get those people back into work, but we haven't really heard anything from either the Conservatives or Labour on this. And it is a significant number of people. You talk about nearly 400,000 family carers who have left employment to take care of an older person or a disabled person. Uh, and that is not including those who have cut down on their hours, as, as Humphrey says. So obviously this is about... Uh, the compassionate case to be making life as as easy as possible for those who are who are doing this kind of work, but there's an economic case as well, right? Yeah, absolutely, a really strong economic case. So um, that our analysis, which, as you say, we included in this latest report. Um, estimates that government will spend around 2.8 billion on welfare benefits for carers who are working age carers who are unable to work because of their caring responsibilities. Um, government will also forego about 3.3 billion in tax and national insurance receipts because this, this working age cohort are unable to work. Um, and we're not talking about converting all these people um, into employees. Not all of them would want to, not all of them would be able to. But I do think it suggests the kind of size of the of, of what's at stake economically here. And I think it's really surprising that government isn't talking about it. You did this poll of over 1,500 carers and you asked them what would help, essentially, uh, what would help them go back into the jobs that they would like to be doing or simply what would help them manage the caring responsibilities that they have and that they've taken on because of failures in, in the state and also because I'm sure a lot of people want to and have a sort of compassionate reason for doing so. What did you find out? Well, the first thing I would flag is that 41% um, of uh, unpaid carers who are currently in work are thinking about leaving their job or reducing their hours in the next year. Um, which is really worrying um, from an ec economic perspective. Um, and we found that 65% of 
unpaid carers who are not working would like to work. So this is a cohort of people that should be receptive to the right kind of policy interventions. And the specific policies that we tested with them, which the carers that we polled were very responsive to, uh, were grants for home adaptations so that um, the people they care for can live more independently, um, whether that's kind of stair lifts, wider doorways, um, ramps, a whole kind of range of things. There is a government program that is supposed to provide this type of support at the moment, but it's not really doing enough. It varies too much from council to council, so it's not support that families can really rely on. We also proposed increasing the earnings limit in carer's allowance. So for listeners who aren't aware, what is the carer's allowance and how does that work at the moment? So carer's allowance is a non-means tested benefit, but to be eligible, you're not able to earn more than £139 a week. That's what's called the earnings limit. And carer's allowance is worth £76 a week. Um, once you breach the earnings limit, you're not entitled to anything at all. So it's a it's a really hard cliff edge. And to be eligible, you have to be caring for somebody for at least 35 hours per week. And £139 is about 13 hours, I think, at the national living wage. So it's really not very many hours at all. Um, so we propose lifting that limit to £250. Um, so that carers are able to work more and still receive their carer's allowance. But that that cliff edge is obviously really significant if you're trying to encourage people into work when they're not sure that their employer will be able to give them the flexibility that they need in order to continue their caring responsibilities because not every employer is, is, is like the BBC. Um, I'm also interested though in the, the kind of intersection between different areas of government because some of this is the NHS, some of it is local authority, some of it is central government grants, some of it is a a, a form of benefit essentially Um, and then there are personal independence payments as as well. Humphrey, what's your experience of how all those different government areas talk to each other and talk to the the end user? What's it like navigating that system? They don't talk to each other. They're meant to. Recently they've created something called integrated care boards where the councils are meant to work more closely with the NHS. I've seen no evidence of it. Um, Essentially, I think in the world of of, um, special needs and social care, you've got the councils that that primarily are meant to deal with it. But if somebody's got very complex needs, the NHS takes over that budget completely. Um, The problem that we're facing now, one of the problems is that the councils, they've had 25, 30% of their budgets taken away from them and yet they still have to deal with social care, which is now taking up about 60% of a council budget. So when it's meant to mend a pothole or set up a playground or something, it's got to go and put an awful lot of money maybe into one person who's fighting for their rights. That is a system that just is so illogical, so contradictory and so immoral that it it needs to be fixed. It doesn't need a discussion. If you're going to take 30% of the budget away from somebody and then the most vulnerable people in the society are going to be affected by that, uh, you need to fix it. And I think the Labour Party was going to have what they called a national care policy whereby it wasn't a postcode lottery and everybody would. But I, I... I'd think that they might now not be doing this. <laughs> I don't quite. You see, it, 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 is, it is a complete nightmare, really. And the thing that we've had with Christopher, my son, is that uh, he has been living in Hammersmith and Fulham Council all his life. So it's not as if he's just dropped in from the heavens and demanded this and that. Um, they have been telling us for the past 15 to 20 years that they will find place for him or they will build a place for him or something like that. That hasn't happened. That has wasted an awful lot of my time and effort in order to try to put get that across the line. And in the past couple of years when he's been, they have ramped up their promises and ramped up their, their violation of those promises. And what I realize, and I'm talking about my case particularly, but one can imagine this goes throughout the country, um, is that those people that violate those promises get away with it and they know they can get away with it. And therefore, there are families up and down the country that are writing letters, thinking things are going to happen, and then they don't. 
and there's been a report. Uh, it wasn't I think it was the former, a retiring NHS ombudsman said this week in an interview that they needed to stop. This was the NHS, but I think it's institutional. And it's the sort of thing we saw in the post office crisis, um, you know, where people protect their colleagues, they cover up, they lie, and then they move on. And if you take that across what Jess just described, each of those people are writing letters, filling in forms, all of that, and, it go, and it's going somewhere where nothing happens. And that is the biggest amount of stress that anybody that's dealing with somebody with special needs or disabilities comes up against. Yeah, there seems to be a real lack of transparency and accountability in the system and also a, a, a role for private companies that take allocated funding and are meant to provide services and the difficulty in getting those services. If, if I, you mentioned transparency, so you, you tripped a nerve, so I have to <laughs> tell you this story. I, the, we, my son was promised a place and, uh, and we were told in an initial meeting that, um, that uh, they would not appoint a kid. You have the, the property and then you have the care provider. They would not appoint a care provider that would not be able to meet his needs and people like that. And they went, they went away and appointed one that couldn't. So I tried to get, find out what had happened. And I had one, two, three, four letters back of what they called final response. Three of them were complete and utter rubbish. And the, third, the fourth one, which was after I did a piece in one of the papers, they buckled under and said sorry and all that sort of stuff. And I sat in a meeting with the head of social services and I said, I've got four letters here. I said, this one is false. It's full of absolute rubbish. And I said, what is it? He said, oh, we don't call it lies and rubbish. Said, we call it varying levels of transparency. Wow. And, you know. That's up there with the, the royal family recollections may vary. Yeah. Yes. Isn't yeah. it? Yeah, it, it was. But this is the mindset of those people that are dealing with people with special needs and disabilities. Well, Any time any party mentions social care, in fact, they're very wary of doing so because any time anything gets mentioned, it has a tendency to, to backfire and blow up. Just look at Theresa May in 2017. But this shouldn't be a party political issue. This is something that is going to affect the vast majority, if not everyone in this country at some point in their lives. This is something that has an economic perspective, a health perspective, uh, a moral imperative to, to sort out. Um, but we're not really seeing any kind of movement on it. And I wonder, Jess, you, you're the, the report has a forward from Andy Burnham, the Labour Mayor of Manchester. Do you think there is scope for taking the politics out of the issue of, of, of social care and, and really getting a cross-party response to this that actually tackles some of these problems that we've been talking about for over a decade? I am not hopeful that it's something either party will talk about in a substantive way ahead of a general election. Um, if the polls are to be believed and we have a Labour government with a considerable majority, you would think that would give them the space to grapple with these more politically difficult issues. But I know I think it will be very difficult to take the politics out of it. Are there examples that we can get from other countries? Because lots of countries are facing ageing populations and uh, a squeeze on budgets at the moment. Like, what, do, what, what do other countries do that we could learn from? Lots of different countries are doing lots of different and interesting things that grapple with kind of different parts of the, the headline problem. Um, so, for example, in Japan, um, there's a really interesting program where you provide an hour of care and in return you get a care credit that will entitle you to an hour of care in future. And you, you can either use that yourself or you can gift it to a friend or relative who needs care themselves. And there's some really interesting research which shows that recipients of care preferred to be cared for by people who are receiving a credit rather than by people who are receiving cash um, because I think there's a nice bit of kind of reciprocity there and it, it just makes the relationship slightly different. And community cohesion. Exactly, exactly. In Canada, for example, they um, offer credits which reduce somebody's tax liabilities if they provide care for a, a, a relative or, or a friend or a spouse. Um, in Italy, they 
really look after carers as well as um, the recipient of care. So as a carer, you would get your own multi-agency carer plan to make sure that you're being looked after and that you have the support you need to look after your your loved one properly. Um, So there are lots of different ways of approaching these issues. And Avery, what do you think would have helped you most or would help you most now in terms of changing changes to the way that social care is provided across the board obviously you've been facing this for two decades in my particular case i, I think i agree is that it, it you know you're not, I, in fact i talked to my local mp andy slaughter i said could could you do a cross-party thing he sent me up the meeting with andrew Gwynn, who's the labor shadow social and both of them said no it wouldn't because our politics is so polarized at the moment that that anybody will cotton onto i mean i think that it needs to be far better regulated. Um, the, 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 the reason that my son is in this situation is because there has been an ideological reaction to some of these big places that were found where people were being abused and that sort of thing, Winterbourne and that. So what they've done is instead of saying, right, we need to go in and regulate these places better, they've closed them all down. And I've in touch with, with many families that, that have their loved ones living in communities where they get to know people very well and they share occupations, they are being moved out of those communities into single flats in social housing where they are isolated uh, and they don't have anybody that they can just have dinner with or hang out with or anything like that. They're isolated in these flats. It's some kind of ideological thinking that they think saves money for some reason, but it doesn't. So the figures that I've got from that is if you create a community of people, six, seven, 12, it doesn't have to be huge, who get to know each other, who have shared interests, who can go on outings together, um, then you save about 40% of of what it would take to put each of those person in, in some sort of social affordable housing. So I think that... If the shadow Labour government, because I don't, this government's doing nothing, it's too much. But if a shadow Labour government just put out a statement saying we support communities for people with special needs. uh, And then the Care Quality Commission, the councils, the NHS would all fund for people to go to such communities. They have to be well regulated. The regulator must be able to go in there at any time to check what's going on. And then I think you need to sort out the the money element. So if somebody is in what they call residential care, that money comes from the council. What they've done is they've created something called supported living, which is meant to be where the care and the the, the real estate is is separate. But it's, it's essentially the same thing. The real estate rent for that comes from the central government. This is back office stuff. It shouldn't be impacting the lives of the, the disabled and the special needs people. It should be sorted out by the people we pay to manage the country. But it, it's not doing that. It's not rocket science. It doesn't need big stuff. It just says, if you had a, um, an elderly relative with dementia, they've broken their hip um, and whatever, you say, well, th- this relative needs to go to an old people's home. And suddenly, they say, oh, we don't have old people's home anymore. Oh, we don't have a, a, a place for somebody with dementia who's got a broken hip. They have to live in the wider community. We would think, well, what's that? That's rubbish, isn't it? But if you're dealing with somebody with learning difficulties, behavioral problems, physical disabilities, and you say, oh, no, they can't live in a community with people like themselves. They have to live alone in an apartment with a care team around them then you're getting into into sort of what I call, I don't know, it's a sort of crazy territory of bad thinking, which discriminates against those with, with complex special needs. And also makes it incredibly difficult for those who are trying to help to navigate yes. the system because there are so many different layers and, and, and mixed lines of accountability. But I was really interested in what you just said about the importance of community Uh, in this issue as a whole. I read some of the case studies in the report, some really interesting stories, uh, some very emotive stories, some from people who didn't realise that they were carers until after Mm. their elderly relatives had had passed away and they kind of worked out that 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 role they'd been filling in the absence of 
of any kind of support. But there was uh, one woman who wrote that after caring for her elderly mother, she realised that she didn't have children and was asking questions about who would then look after her and how difficult the system is to to navigate and she talked about setting up a support group of other people her age in her local area with a kind of understanding that they would all help support each other through this which sounds in a way very innovative but also very simple that's what communities are sort of meant to be about and I wondered if if you think that we need a kind of cultural shift in how we think about care because it does seem to be something that so many individuals when they end up in that situation which can sometimes be very sudden and unexpected feel like they're in on their own even though it is a an experience that is at various points in people's lives going to be near universal yeah absolutely i i do think we um there needs to be a cultural shift and i think one of the strongest mechanisms for driving um, that that shift would be through employers. Um, and, and we spoke to some really fabulous employers who operate really strong um, carers networks. And I think that matters because it's about bringing people together that have shared experience and also making care visible in the workplace and making sure that carers um, feel like they can be transparent and open about their needs and that they don't need to make excuses. And I suppose encouraging employers to recognise the many kind of skills and attributes that carers develop because they're resilient, they're organised, they're brilliant communicators, they're kind of not not liabilities and employers shouldn't be looking at a carer and thinking, oh, are they going to need a few extra days off? They should be seeing kind of all the brilliant things that they do and, and how well they handle a very difficult situation. Um, and so I think if we're thinking about trying to, to drive this cultural shift, I think the workplace would be a really good place to start. Would you agree with that? Yes. Uh, I mean, certainly in my experience with the BBC, I mean, they got it. They understood it. And OK, you know, how much does that impact a career or not? That's That's everybody's choice. But they understood it. But I don't know whether... A smaller employer could afford that, but this is a. But I think the the cultural shift in my mind has to be that if of your wonderful wide audience here, if anybody is sitting in a local council in a management position, remember your duty of candour. If you can't do something, tell them. If you can do it and are going to do it, do it. Don't write a letter back that is full of rubbish, because when you're spending this amount, you know, a huge amount of time caring for somebody, it takes it out of you emotionally. When you're also dealing with this sort of, I don't know, amoral, administrative dreadfulness, that then drains you even more. So if there's one change that needs to take place, it's the part of our society that we saw with the post office scandal, that we saw with the hospital scandals, and we see it every day with local councils and, and, and the disabled. <laughs>